Hey guys, welcome back to We Met at Acme. This is the first solo episode that I've ever recorded on camera in a studio. So we'll see if this is any different. I'm curious what you guys have to say, what you think. I was really excited because May is mental health month. I don't even know what that really means, like mental health awareness month, I guess. And my mental health has always been such a priority for me. You know, I always talk about therapy and how important it is to, you know, prioritize your mental wellness and well-being. And so I really wanted to record with this therapist. She's a therapist that specializes in postpartum. And we were going to, you know, knock it out for the last episode in May. And unfortunately, she had to reschedule. And so we will still do that episode with a professional but it will not be in May. So I was like, I still want to talk about mental health. I still want to talk about the struggles and kind of what I've gone through in postpartum and what my marriage has gone through and all of that good stuff. So I'm just going to get on here and talk to you directly. It's just going to be me, a solo episode, talking about kind of my experience. And then I also had some women write in about their experiences as well. So we'll talk about theirs too. But I guess we'll just start off um, with just how I have been feeling. I'm not going to say how you guys have been feeling because I don't know. Also, if you are listening to this and have not gone through like a postpartum change, I hope that this is still interesting to you because maybe you will one day. And it's just something that I didn't understand at all before I had a baby. And granted, I'm no expert. Let's be very clear. I have a four month old son. I don't have more than one kid. I don't have, you know, like I I, I'm not I haven't been doing this for a while. I am very new to the game and I actually probably would feel a certain type of way if I heard a new, a first time mom of a four month old come on and be like, this is the way that it goes. And this is how everything changed. No, I'm just sharing my own experience. I, this isn't like a guide of any sorts. This is literally just what I have been going through and maybe it can be like, you can relate to it. And so what I've shared so far really about my experience was I shared the birth story and how I had like this kind of traumatic birth situation where I had to have an emergency C-section. If you haven't listened to that episode, I would suggest going back and listening to that and then listening to this. I felt very lucky in that after I had the traumatic birth, I didn't really experience what I was worried I would experience as like postpartum anxiety or postpartum depression. I there's also postpartum OCD. There's a lot of postpartum things that you can experience. And I don't know if anyone is watching Vanderpump Rules or watched it, but Sheena recently talked about how she was going through postpartum OCD and how that affected her. And, you know, someone else in the episode was like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. And she was like, yeah, I learned it was a thing. So there's a lot of things that one can go through. There's also postpartum rage, which I have touched on a little bit, which is kind of just like raging at your partner randomly and not being able to really control yourself yelling or just losing it at usually your partner. I'm sure people also rage at their moms or, you know, the people closest to them have probably experienced postpartum rage from a new mother if they are going through that. And so I experienced that a little bit, but I did feel lucky. I felt like I didn't really have like a real hormonal imbalance post having kids, post having a child, (laughs) I only have one. And I think that part of why is because I was breastfeeding and I don't know, I've heard that helps kind of wean you more slowly hormonally off of all the hormones that you're getting during your pregnancy. Again, I'm not a doctor, so definitely, you know, anything that I'm saying, take with a grain of salt. Again, just my experience. 
but um, I didn't really have that. And so I was grateful. What I did have was a little postpartum rage. And what I also had was a lot of resentment because I breastfed our son for my son for, oh, I guess he's all of our sons, you know, <laughs> because if you've been listening for a while, it feels that way um, for three months. And I did what's called exclusive breastfeeding, which means that your child is just getting the milk from your boobs. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're exclusively putting him onto your boob to get that. You could be pumping it into a bottle, but just that's what he's fed exclusively. Right. So that's the meaning of that. And I did that for three months and it felt good in that my role was really important. Right. Like if if I was gone for a certain amount of time and we didn't have milk stored or like in the freezer or whatever, then my son couldn't eat essentially. So I was really needed and important and that felt cool. And I can see why a lot of mothers like to feel that way. It's a really good feeling, honestly. And I had a good experience with breastfeeding. And I know that it's really rare. And that doesn't mean that I enjoyed every moment of it. There were times where like if I put, if I was nursing him where it hurt or, you know, pumping was annoying, but in general, in general, I had a good breastfeeding experience. And again, like I attribute that to having a tough time getting pregnant and a tough delivery. I, I think that everyone gets something bad somewhere. No one has a flawless experience throughout. And I talked about that on my episode with Lily Walla. Like no one really gets out unscathed when it comes to fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, whatever it is, right? Like there's, there's always something. And so I felt very lucky and very blessed that I had a good breastfeeding experience. But during that experience, I was the one waking up with for like waking up with my son throughout the night and having to pump if I wasn't feeding him directly. And Stephen, my husband, was I love how I'm introducing you to him for the first time as if we're not always talking about this. But Stephen didn't have to wake up throughout the night. You know, he was getting like not eight to nine hours of sleep per night because I was going to bed earlier. And, you know, we kind of typically go to bed at the same time. And that's, I would say, when like initial resentment started to build. And that doesn't mean that he wasn't so great and so helpful. And I know that this is something that a lot of women talk about, you know, how their husbands are not that helpful. And I will say Steven is a very hands-on guy. He's, you know, we went to a party recently and we were talking to two different couples and the, the husbands were bragging, like literally bragging about how they didn't meet their child until the kids started laughing at like three plus months. And I don't know what kind of reaction they expected from us like we tried to you know be like ha that's you know funny man but like afterwards we were like that is so crazy to brag about like it's not cool to not have anything to do with your kid for the first 3 months of their life obviously if you're you know if you're blessed with a great nurse and you have like the luxury of help that's so amazing but even then, or at least with us, and we had a, a great baby nurse, like I still wanted to be involved and Steven still wanted to be involved. There was no part of us that was like, oh yeah, call us when he's three months, you know, like, I don't know that to me, like, I don't, that wouldn't work for me, but I guess, you know, I'm sure things are different once you have one child under your belt already. Like maybe if it were our second kid and we wanted to focus on the first one, I don't know. But, um, you know, Stephen is really hands on and I'm really grateful for that. But it's also very much like a be careful what you wish for, because once you have a very involved husband and father of your kid, it's almost like your behavior as a mom, which should be default amazing, right? Because you are 
a mom. Like you are the primary caregiver, whether you want to be or not, that becomes like scrutinized the things that you do. And I'm like, I don't even know where to look here. I hope I'm looking in the right place. Um, I was looking down before I'm going to start looking up, but the things that you do are, you know, questioned and things like that. And, and I've talked to my therapist about this and again, I'm able to see the good in it, which is that Steven is such an involved parent, but I get frustrated because it can feel like I'm being questioned as a mom when I feel like I have the instincts that he doesn't. So I'll give you a really silly example there. So now let's go to like post three months, right? So now it's Steven and I and the baby, no baby nurse, and I'm not breastfeeding anymore. So technically the plates should be like 50, 50, if that makes any sense. Like the, in terms of us being able to parent our child, other than the fact that I'm at home more than Steven is, cause he's working in an office every day. We are like now 50, 50, meaning we can both feed our child. He doesn't just need something from me that he can't get from his dad, et cetera. So evening the playing field here, we were transitioning Zachary, my son, to, um, you know, feeding, sorry, to sleeping in a sleep sack versus sleeping in a swaddle. And this was at around three months and everything was very important and significant. And if you're a first time parent, you understand like just the stakes are so high and they definitely don't need to be so high. And I'm sure I'm going to look back and laugh at the way that I was or the way that we are about his schedule and all of that. But right now the stakes are high for whatever reason, right? His sleep is important and it is like it affects the rest of his day and how he eats and how he grows and all of that stuff. And so we were transitioning him from the swaddle to the sleep sack and he was struggling to sleep through the night initially. And um, I was I'm in this mom group. And that's another thing like dads do not have the support that moms do when it comes to parenting. And I believe that that's by choice, right? Like I've offered to Steven, you should join this WhatsApp group for dads. And he's like, no. Um, And they also don't talk to each other about dad stuff. Like every now and then he will talk to one of his friends and be like, oh, you know, how's your son doing? And oh, like this is how my son's doing. But it's not an ongoing support in the same way that being in a mom group is being in a mom group feels like you're being hugged at all times. It's such a good feeling. And so I had spoken to my mom group about the transition from swaddle to sleep sack. And it was stressed that what was really important and helpful was having a noise machine in the room and then having a noise machine outside the room. Because for us, the setup is that his room is like in the kitchen living space, basically. And so if we want to function in our apartment after he goes to bed, we're going to need those two noise machines. So I relayed this information to Stephen, keeping in mind that this was said by a lot of moms. And these moms are not dumb. Like they're smart and good at being moms and have been parents for longer than us. And of course, his initial reaction is like, but what if that is really bad for his ears? Or, you know, how does that affect him? What if he won't be able to sleep without it? If we're traveling, like he asked these questions. And again, these are all valid, great questions to ask. But if you are the mother of this child and you are being questioned in every suggestion that you bring up that you know works for these kids, it's going to piss you off eventually. And so that's really hard. And then it kind of goes into the marriage and how that changes post kids. And I think that if you are considering having kids with your partner, your marriage has to be so strong so strong. You, of course you can fight and argue, right? But you need to have that foundation set in stone. If you've ever considered divorcing your partner before you have a kid, you are in for a treat if you want to have kids, because it literally goes from, oh, like, 
are we going to work out to I am walking to the like courthouse tomorrow and requesting a divorce. Like it can go that quickly if your marriage isn't solid because you will start to bicker about things that you didn't even know that you would have cared about and you don't even think about before you have a kid because why would you think about those things, you know? And it's like little things, but primarily it's about your child because you both care about this thing so much and you both want to do right by your child and you also don't want to argue. And I think it's almost like because you so badly don't want to be arguing and don't want to be bickering, it's almost like you are doing it more because you're like, it makes me so sad to yell and fight with this person because we now have like this adorable child who, you know, is watching everything that we do. And because of that, it's almost that much more pressure to never have an argument. Whereas when you don't have a child, like if you argue, who cares? You know, there's no nothing at stake. But when you argue, when you have a child, it's like, oh, my God, I don't want him to like pick up on the fact that our energy isn't good. You know what I mean? It's just like it adds that layer. And so going back to, you know, three months being on the same playing field, it's more just like I so my postpartum rage really stopped. Like it wasn't that crazy. It was just when he would do something that would annoy me, like something little. And again, it goes back to setting up your partner to win. Like if I was doing a lot that day, if I woke up with him that morning and I was washing more bottles than Steven was or changing more diapers or whatever, and not that anyone's keeping score, but if I felt that way in my head, then I would, you know, start building this resentment towards Steven when instead I could simply just be like, hey, do you mind getting the next few feeds or diaper changes? Because I'm feeling like I've been doing a lot and it would like it, I need I need that help. Right. If you just ask for the thing then your partner will probably do it and they probably want to help. But men are not mind readers. And we knew this before we had kids with them. And so once you have a kid with your partner, that doesn't change. They don't all of a sudden become a mind reader. You still need to spell out for them exactly what you need them to do to be helpful. Like it's it's just never, you know. And so back to the resentment. Hold on, I need a sip of water. Back to the resentment, once I stopped breastfeeding, it definitely went away a little bit, but then there's just resentment of so many other things, like your body, for example. As a woman, your body changes so much when you go through pregnancy and postpartum. Of course, right? You are growing a human being, and then you are giving birth to a human being, and then your body is like, where, what was I before? What am I supposed to do? Um, your boobs, for example, like my boobs were, they started off pretty big. And then when I got pregnant, they were huge. And then when I was breastfeeding, they were even bigger. And now it wasn't just like Zachary took the milk from me. It was like, he took my boobs too. Like, I don't know where they went, but they're so small. Like, I've never experienced this. And they're obviously like, like pancakes basically. And so, I mean, God bless women who, you know, just embrace it. Right. Because it's really hard to do. It's really hard to embrace your new body post, you know, postpartum. But anyway, your partner, if you have a male partner, their body does not change at all. Nothing happens to them in those nine months and nothing happens to them postpartum for the most part, right? Some, some men suffer from postpartum anxiety. Steven definitely did a little bit, but for the most part, nothing really, you know, changes with them hormonally, at least as far as we know. And they just get this like adorable, like cute baby and they don't have to do anything to get there. So I think you are ready. Like when you give birth and your husband's there, you're already like at 
resentment 100. And it's almost like the resentment has to go down. And the man has to earn the less resentment by being helpful and contributing and like, you know, telling you you're amazing and telling you you're the best mom ever and telling you how much it means to you that they, that you carry their baby and that you did this and you did that and giving you foot massages. And, you know, it's like, it's like someone was talking about recently. I think it was, someone was telling me that Alex Earl did some episode of her podcast about how, when she meets a guy, the trust is like at zero to begin with. And then they have to build it up to like a hundred. And that's basically the same thing, but the opposite with the resentment, the resentment starts at a hundred and you have to get it down to zero. And it's really hard to do. It is not something that just happens. And in order to do that, communication is so key. Like it is so important to tell your partner what you need them to do and how you are feeling. Like, for example, the other night we went to an event and It was on a Saturday and it was the first time that we were going to like a longer event that wasn't a dinner that was just two hours long. And Zachary had just gotten his four months shots and he had like a delayed reaction. He had a fever. It was so sad and he was screaming and crying and like wasn't eating well. And then the next day we had this event and I was really nervous about it because our nanny wasn't available to come watch him. And like, she's just someone that we really trust with him. And then, so our in-laws came and by the way, we trust them so much too. They just don't have the same experience that our nanny does. You know, that's her job. She's, she knows exactly what she's doing. And we were really nervous for them because our son was not himself. And so that's really hard, especially as the first time that they're, you know, taking on the role of putting him to bed and doing his nighttime routine on their own. And so it was really nerve wracking. And this was an event that we had to go to. I mean, could we have canceled? Sure. But these people mean a lot to us. It's, you know, I grew up with the bat mitzvah girl. She's the sweetest, most amazing person. And I'm so happy that we went and that we supported them. And I have no regrets about going at all. But when we were there, I started to feel feelings that I've never felt before. First of all, like insane mom guilt and that I've felt before in increments, but the mom guilt was so serious because he was sick and he wasn't himself and I wasn't there to like hold him and comfort him. And so while I'm going through all these feelings, like my partner, Steven is right next to me and he's experiencing all of it through me and he's experiencing it as well. You know, just we're checking the monitor the whole time. We're checking in with his parents, like how'd this go? How'd that go? And there was no part of me, at least, and I'm not going to speak for him that could enjoy that event. And I said to him, I was like, there is nowhere in the world that like literally nowhere. Like I, I said this on, you know, my Insta, like on the like Cannes Film Festival Italy, like this, that there's nowhere in the world that right now I would rather be than with my son at night, like to make sure that he has a good night and goes to bed. And I don't know if that's going to change. And I hope it does change. And I've heard it will change as he gets older and it, you know, things get easier and it matters less that he sleeps through the night and all this stuff. But right now in you know, where I am today on May 20th, 2024. Wait, is it really May 20th? I guess it is. Wow. Okay. May 20th, 2024. That is how I'm feeling right now as my son is four months. And I'm sure I'll look back on this and I will be like, that was hilarious that I felt that way. Things are so different now, but that's just the way that I feel. And there are some moms out there who don't feel that way. And that's amazing. And honestly, I'm jealous of that. And I think maybe, you know, I I think there's zero judgment around pe- how people feel. And there's like feeling free and feeling like, and I'm sure by the way, if my son was someone, was a baby who cried all the time and this and that, like 
I'm sure I would want to escape. And that's really normal to feel that way. But right now in the stage that he's in, I just want to be with him all the time. And I can't imagine not being with him all the time. And we do have to go to this wedding coming up. And I'm already having so much anxiety because we're not going to be with him. And I wanted to take him. And Steven was like, no, we can't take him. Like, we can't afford to take him because we can barely afford to go ourselves. It's like an international trip that's so expensive. And and like we wouldn't have child care. And so it's just something that I have to accept. But anyway, the point is that I, we went to this event and could not enjoy it whatsoever. And I started to have kind of like a hormonal switch and I couldn't knock it. Like I couldn't get happy after this. It, it didn't matter that he ended up going to sleep, albeit, you know, two hours late and, you know, he slept through the night and he was fine. It didn't matter. It was just something shifted in me that I was like, I am not cool with this. Like I'm not the cool mom that I thought that I was. I have like a ton of anxiety around being away from my child for so long. And it's something that I never understood before I had my son. And now I totally understand, but it's really hard. And then it makes things just not sexy with your husband when you are, you know, thinking about like when you're just, when you're sad and you're pissed and you're just feeling all this stuff. And another thing is my husband, Stephen, and I've mentioned this before, but he needs like this sweetness from me in order to want to like have sex. And I think that's very normal, right? I don't think most guys want to have sex with you when you're yelling at them or belittling them or telling them what they need to do better, right? And so, but the problem is during this time when we are new parents, it's not easy for me to be sweet the way that it might have been before because I am tired. I am so tired and I don't think I can show up for him, at least right now, in the way that I did before, like being his, you know, when you're married to a man who, you know, a lot of most men like don't see a therapist and whatever, like you are their therapist, you're their best friend, you are everything to your husband. And after you have a baby, you don't have the same amount to give to this man. And like you can fake it, but the reality is you're so tired and you just want to not speak after a long day. And like men are just different than us. And I feel like men come home and they're like, they like pull off the mask of being like, you know, whoever they are at their corporate job where they don't really talk to anyone or like get loved in the same way. And they're like, I just want to be cuddled. And I just, you know, I want to talk to you about my day. And as a woman who, you know, was at home that day or even, you know, worked and then was home for half the day or whatever it was that my situation has been that day. All I want is silence. I want silence. I want to look at my phone. I want to watch a dumb murder show, which also has become a problem because we can't watch TV after he goes to sleep anymore because he's in like the living space. And so we can only watch TV in our bedroom. And Steven doesn't let me watch murder shows because he's like, that's so dark. I don't want to watch that now that I have a kid. Like I can't think about a kid getting murdered. And I'm like, oh no, you know? And so luckily we can, you know, agree on like watching summer house or something like that. But I just want to shut my brain off and I don't want to talk. Like my battery is done. It is complete when I am home after like a long day. And anyway, I just feel like I just like vented for so long, but anyway, you get, you get the gist. And so he needs the sweetness from me in order to like want to have sex and my sweetness is maybe like once or twice a week at best is when I'm sweet to him. And that's not anything, any fault of his own. That's just because of the things I just mentioned. I'm tired, 
you know? And of course I'm nice to him, but you know what I mean? Like really being sweet on him and like giving him like a little massage and, you know, like, you know, being cute and sweet, whatever you get the gist. And so as a result, like we are not having as much sex as we used to. And I think that is very normal for people post kids, especially in the newborn stage. And so if you can relate to that, you are not alone. And it's a good segue to something that I wanted to read. And then I want to read the other things that people have written in and wrote to me because they are all very relatable. And I think that you guys will relate to them. So this is a post from this account Wilder Beginnings. And I don't know her personally, but I feel like she should come on the podcast at some point because she articulates everything very well. She said, this is 16 weeks postpartum. We're still waking up around four times a night, sometimes three, sometimes five. I'm tired, but I don't mind. It's what she needs from me and that's okay. I nurse to sleep every chance I get. Bassinet bassinet naps are maximum 28 to 31 minutes long. Any good nap is only when she's held or worn, which I do at least once a day. I don't fit into any clothes and I don't like my body. I'm very uncomfortable and sometimes get upset when I have to get dressed, but that's okay. My husband and I are roommates. We've gone on one date and the baby was there and it lasted for 30 minutes. And no, I'm not ready for anything else and that's okay. Some days I leave the house and can't believe the world is still turning and I'm part of it. Some days I have to rush home because it's all too much and I'd rather be with my TV friends than the real people who don't get it. Some days are hard. Some days are amazing. I don't place more value on one or the other. I just let it all happen. I'm not starting to feel like myself yet because I'm someone entirely new. There's no returning to someone I've never met before. Sometimes that makes me sad. Sometimes it makes me amazed that this person was always inside me and I can't believe I get to be her. Um, sometimes I can't wait for the day or week to end. Sometimes I hold her and think if I don't memorize this exact moment, the exact noise she made, the exact way her soft skin feels against mine, I'm going to die. Some days everything clicks and I feel like a superhero. Some days I never leave the house or brush my teeth because I can't get it together and I feel bad about it. Sometimes she cries and I cry because I'm tired and overwhelmed with everything I have to do. Sometimes she smiles with her whole face and her eyes light up when she sees me and I cry because my heart is cracked open and I'm overwhelmed with everything I get to do. This is 16 weeks postpartum. So I thought that was really beautiful and really relatable especially the part of like going outside and not believing that the world is still turning. I had a lot of feelings when I was first postpartum about, you know, leaving and oh my God, like I can't believe everyone here doesn't know that I am so changed, that I'm so different. I can't believe the world is still going on when I am such a different person now. And I think that that is really, you know, something to note And of course, how she feels in her clothes. I think we can all relate to that. And her husband and her being roommates, you know, it's okay to feel like you're not ready to go back to having like a sexual relationship with your husband. I think that it will happen eventually. And for me, like, and I hope my in-laws and parents aren't listening to this episode, but we, we did do it at six weeks postpartum when I was cleared, but it wasn't really something I started enjoying until it stopped being painful. And I think that that's very normal and like you have to do what's best for you. And like your husband has to be okay with that because if they wanted a kid, like that's what they signed up for, you know? And then, um, I had asked people to write in, as I mentioned about their experience with how their relationship has changed postpartum. And so this is, this is some people's experience. This person said, it's been a roller coaster. That's for sure. It's definitely not easy. And I finally learned the hard way that if I want my husband to help with something with the baby, I have to ask. I thought he would just want to give her a bath or help feed her, but no, I had to ask him to do it. Men are wild and they don't have the same instinct as us women. So that is really very true. Um, again, like for me, I do feel like Steven has 
very good instincts with our child, but that comes with some negatives also, right? As like me feeling like, you know, there have been times, and I shared about this with some close friends recently, but there have been times where I'm like, is he better than me? Like, is he better than this? Is, Is he better at this than me? And that is a really scary thought too. So I think there actually is some comfort on the other side of, if you have that husband who has no idea what to do and is kind of useless, it's almost like at le- like the grass is always greener, right? And it's like, at least you know that you're better than him. If your husband is like overachieving when it comes to dad stuff, you could tell yourself and be like, wow, am I not a good mom? Cause he's such a good dad. So again, the grass is always greener. This person said, with both kids, I had such raging postpartum anxiety. My partner was like, what the fuck? Because I was so chill before. But now I need things to be a certain way slash on schedule or I kind of lose it. It got way better after 15 months. I think once nap and baby, once naps were normal and baby was eating normal meals. So that's another thing. It's like your personality can totally change. You could be this really chill person. And then as a mother, you could be really different or like totally the same. But I think most people have experienced a slight personality change post kids. This person said, girl, same. I feel dumb admitting that I want to be home with the baby. Okay. This is because I shared that when I went to this event, all I wanted was to be home with the baby. Like that there's a shame in that domestic experience. We have to remind ourselves that we're multidimensional women who can be both a cuddly homebody and a cool carefree person who goes out without their kids. But sometimes we crave more of one. And that's really true. Like to vacillate between, you know, being that person who's home and happy at the home. Right. And being that person who's like, Oh, I can go out with my kids. Like I don't need to, you know, be home all the time. And I think that that's really important. I think what's like the hardest for me is that it has to feel so worth it if I'm going out without Zachary and, and it doesn't, it's, if Steven's home with him, that's actually fine. And that's allows me to do something that even if it's not like totally worth it, I'm okay with. But if we have hired help or our in-laws or whoever's watching him and both of us are out, what we're doing has to be so fun. And now I understand, and it took me a long time to understand this. And I apologize to anyone if I ever made them feel any type of way before I understood this, right? That going to weddings and going to events and going to this, first of all, is really hard to commit to when you have a kid. And second of all, you really have to like be in the wedding party or like, you know, very close to this person. If you have a newborn or like an infant or even a toddler and you are considering going to this event because your First of all, spending so much money probably on childcare while you're gone because like that adds up. And that's in addition to paying for a room for this person's wedding and paying for a gift and maybe a flight if it's destination or gas in a car if it's, you know, a two hour drive, whatever it is. So if you are someone that is questioning, should I go to that wedding? I don't feel like, and you're having anxiety about it and you have a child don't go to the wedding. Like do not go to the wedding if, and guess what? They might not understand it now, but when they have a child in two years, one year, five years, if they want to, right, they will get it and you will be forgiven eventually. Um, This person said in the first few months postpartum, when I was exclusively breastfeeding, once I put the baby down for a nap or to bed at night, it seemed that my husband then wanted me to give him a lot of attention. And I thought, really, I'm spent. Isn't it your turn? It isn't your turn to get attention from me. That is a very real thing. And I actually was talking to my mom about this recently. And I was like, you know, what was my dad like when you were postpartum? And like, how did you guys get along? How did it change your dynamic? And she said, you know, he was really needy. And he felt like I was giving all my attention to you or your sister and not to him. And luckily I haven't experienced that, right? Like Steven has never at least flat out said to me, like you're giving Zachary all of our attention. If anything, I feel like he is giving all of his attention to Zachary and not to me, but not really, you know? And, um, 
I just think that it's so hard for everyone involved, right? When you're dealing with a newborn, but for someone like this person's husband who feels neglected, it's, it's hard because you want to be like, shut the fuck up. Like, like, let me get out the violin. But at the same time, you do have to realize that like your relationship is really different to them and they have to lower their expectations because as women, we are so spread thin. We're not going to be able to satisfy our husbands, our jobs, our babies, ourselves all in the same day. Like someone, like every one person, maybe two are going to win that day, but it's never going to be all four winning. Like that's just impossible. This person said, I'm not trying to sound obnoxious, but I think my husband loves me more and is in awe of me for carrying our son for nine months and then giving birth to him. And I'm like a raging hormonal bitch that wants him to stop talking to me. And I'm constantly snapping at him. I love him so much. but Being a mom is a lot of work and I just don't have the time or mental capacity to have the same relationship we had pre baby. And I don't think he fully comprehends what I'm going through and feeling on a daily basis. This, I think, is probably the most relatable thing that I've read because this is so true. Like you do this as women, we do this amazing thing. And the men in our lives are astonished by how we did this. Oh my God, that's amazing. And we hate them. Like we literally are like, I need to discard you immediately. And I don't know what it is. Like, it's just something hormonally and it changes. And of course you, you really love them. You know, you can't hate someone without loving them, but you're just like, you know, and it's funny because I remember when I was like, when I was pregnant and I was thinking about how my relationship would change. And a friend of mine who had a child at the time was like, oh my God, you're going to be so much more attracted to Steven because seeing him as a dad is so hot. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm like excited for that. And now that I do see him as a dad, it's not that it's not hot. It's so sweet, but it's not like sexy. I can't explain it. Like when your husband is like, oh, good, you, good, you, good, you, good. Like there's not, you're not like, oh my God, like, oh, that's so sexy. Like, it's just, you know, like uh, maybe when he's like in the wild and like doing like fun stuff with your kid, but in the infant stage, it's not sex. Like you're not looking at your husband who's talking in baby talk to your child and being like, oh wow. Like I got to hold on. Like I got to go touch myself in the bathroom. Like it's not, it's not sexy yet. I think it will be, you know, and the more I see him as a dad, but that was one thing that I was like, yeah, I haven't experienced that. Like, I think he's sexy and I think he's hot and I'm still attracted to him, but I'm not most attracted to him when he's like changing Zachary's diapers, you know? This person said, for me, three and a half years in, it's still the same. Even when I'm doing something amazing or traveling somewhere super fun without my babies, it is so hard to actually be fully present and enjoy myself. I do it because it's important to me to have an identity outside of being a mom, but sometimes I really have to push myself. I get that. I get that. And I feel like this is similar to when like you're in a relationship at first and you're like, I want to spend all my time with this person, but I know that that's going to turn them off. Right. Or I know that that's not the right move. And so I have to go like deliberately see my girlfriends. Right. It's like, you know, you need to step away from your kid, but that's not actually what makes you happiest, but it's what you need to do. It's exactly as this person said, to have your own identity. This person said, my husband is amazing and so understanding and patient, but I haven't figured out how to still prioritize relationship and work and family and friends and working out, et cetera. I just feel like I'm doing 60% in all areas of my life and not truly excelling. This isn't something I expected because I was feeling good right before I went back to work. I think this is again, so relatable as I mentioned before, like not everything's going to win that day. And so If you're at 60%, by the way, 60% into your relationship, work, family, friends, and working out is great. That's something to be proud of. And I think that, you know, now being a mom and again, a new mom and still figuring it out, but I have so much grace for my mom friends when they, like, if they didn't show up for something or if they didn't respond to a text, like, 
you just kind of have this understanding and, and you get it in a way that you didn't before. Um, this person said so much bickering nonstop. My husband's priority is the baby and not me. This is something that I've definitely felt with Steven before. And again, it's the grass is greener. Like it's a good feeling because you're like, wow, my husband is so thoughtful. He cares so much about our child, but then it's like, but did he forget about me? Like, did he forget I existed? Like, for example, one night, um, recently, before we got comfortable with Zachary sleeping through the night in his sleep sack, we were being really careful about making noise and having lights on in the common living space. And so Steven, I was out with a girlfriend and he was home and he decided to order Thai food and eat it in our room as to not, you know, disturb Zachary in his sleep which to me was like, oh, you do not give a fuck about me because first of all, I'm allergic to peanuts and there's all like so much peanuts in Thai food. And second of all, you're eating this in our bedroom, luckily not in our bed, but in our bedroom. And my first thought was like, you do not care about me. Like you are only thinking about our son, which is amazing, but it's really hard because like I need to be prioritized too. And I think the same is the same makes sense in reverse. Right. And yeah, I mean, that would piss me off. And that did piss me off. And I was like, how fucking like the first thing I walked in instead of being like, thanks for doing the bedtime routine tonight, you know, and covering, not covering cause he's his dad. But you know, while I was out with a girlfriend, my first thought was like, did you eat Thai food in here? <laughs> like, and I know it's not where it should go, but that's exactly a perfect example of the bickering. Right. Um, this person said, my relationship was so fun and spontaneous. We went on frequent adventures that becomes so hard as new parents. And much of the conversation is about the baby. And there are so many new responsibilities to divvy up. It can feel like you're just work colleagues trying to get the job done instead of romantic partners. Plus, when you finally do have an hour or two, you're exhausted from work and baby and you just want to sit on the couch and not talk. It's definitely a learning process to capitalize on free time and just enjoy each other's company. My baby turned one and I feel like we're getting back to being us versus being parents. It's also so hard as the mom to accept that you're likely the primary parent and will do 75% of the mental load. My husband is such a great father and does everything I ask of him, but it's just not intuitive to him. Um, she said, um, Sorry, I lost where I was. I have to teach him a lot, which means I have to be the one doing a lot of the research. It can feel like things aren't 50-50. I also have a really hard time asking for help, which left me feeling really resentful. I learned that I'm just so much happier if I ask for things I need help with. It's not weak or being a bad mom. Men have a difficult time reading women in regular life, let alone with a baby involved. Got to set them up to win here too. So that was really helpful. And I guess we'll end on that note, which is set your partner up to win. Don't forget to be sweet to them um, on both ends, right? Men be sweet to your women and women be sweet to your men and women be sweet to your women. If you're in a lesbian relationship and men be sweet to your men, if you're in a gay relationship and everyone just be sweet to your partner and try not to forget that sweetness, but also know that it's normal for your relationship to feel different post kids. And I hope this was helpful. I feel like it was just kind of like one big rant. Um, but yeah, let me know if you related to anything that was said. And, um, I really appreciate you guys for listening. And if you want more episodes like this, feel free to write a review and let me know or shoot me a DM. Okay.